World War One. So okay. right. take it away. Well, good. So uh, this this presentation is is uh, kind of a threefold aspect. It's uh, not only is there discussion about a watch that I had purchased, and uh, but there's also the the restoration of the watch, which is the main main thrust here. Uh, but there's also a bit of history to who John Grant is, and then being able to tell information from the from an inscription that is on the on the watch. And so. Um, uh, let's see, Get, go to the next slide. So uh, as the conversation was beginning to turn that uh, World War I, uh, which is the period of this watch, uh, is a remarkable period for a, a number of things. Uh, upheaval, change. Uh, we already talked a little bit about uh, the casualties of the war, that there were approximately 40 million killed with uh, a third of that total uh, globally just to disease and, and there was the uh, Spanish influenza pandemic of, that started in 1918, which um, uh, continued for a number of years actually after 1918. And uh, the largest and first outbreak was in a military, US military camp in, um, here in the United States. Uh, but it, other things that happened, it was the beginning of prohibition uh, in, in this time frame too, the 18th amendment was passed and adopted. Uh, there's also the, uh, for the things that were going on elsewhere in the world, such as the Bolsheviks overthrew the Tsar and established uh, what became approximately 70 years of communism and brutal uh, totalitarianist di dictatorship in, in a large swath of, yeah, of, of Asia. Um, more horologically focused, uh, the two of the bigger events that occurred during World War I is, is that there was the institution of daylight savings. Uh, here in the United States, daylight savings came into effect on April 15th uh, and was followed very closely by Canada. Uh, oops, sorry, Canada came April 15th or the United States was March 31st. I'm reading my slides out of order for my text. Um, but one of the other things that occurred during World War I is that the wristwatch became uh, especially more common amongst men. Uh, especially officers and enlisted uh, they were coming back from the war had, had discovered the utility of the wristwatch and began to wear them into their civilian life. Now the wristwatch had been around for a while. Uh, uh, I think the earliest military use of, of wristwatches were by uh, the British in the Boer War of South Africa. And uh, you can find watches that are of that period. Uh, they are often converted watches, but during uh, the lead up to World War I, uh, watch manufacturers, especially the Swiss manufacturers, were beginning to actually make movements in cases specifically to be worn by men. In the United States, uh, before the United States even entered World War I, uh, we had started shipping, uh, the, the various wa uh, watch producers had started shipping watches to England, especially, uh, Waltham, uh, Elgin, uh, particularly were uh, very early adopters of getting into uh, creating wristwatches and not just taking a woman's uh, watch and, and soldering on lugs, although that did occur. Uh, but in this case, uh, this is a watch that dates from about 1918 and uh, was purposely made as a wristwatch. <clears throat> Everything from uh, like the case design uh, the movement, although it does appear in women's watches, it is uh, almost a transitional movement because you'll notice that the crown is at the 12 o'clock position, and uh, but the crown is positioned at the three o'clock position on the case. And I bought I bought this watch. Uh, I got it inexpensively off of eBay uh, about, a, about two years ago, and I bought it because I was looking for parts, and it was. Uh, it came pretty cheaply. Uh, but when I arrived, uh, there was a couple things that stood out and I actually set it aside with the intent of restoring it. Uh, it was, as, as it arrived to me, it was a partial case. Uh, and as the two images that you see are uh, exactly how the watch arrived. Uh, the, the image on the white uh, background is it sitting on my bench, but the fuzzy image down at the bottom is what was shown by the seller. And what's interesting 
to that is that it has the remnants of a band. It's a uh, woven fabric band that was used um, at the time for watches. Uh, there was several styles of bands. There's actually some really good websites out there that talk about development of what eventually became the NATO style band. And this is probably a, uh, the earliest forerunner of what eventually uh, is standard issue on, on military rest watches today. Uh, the movement as a seven jewel movement um, by Waltham. It is the, uh, uh, oh, I didn't even put this in here, but it is uh, model 1907, uh, a three O size movement. So three O size is about uh, one and three thirtieths of an inch or 27.94 uh, millimeters. And uh, the movement came with a broken staff, but was otherwise complete. Uh, it wasn't missing anything. And uh, you can use the information that's either on the web or there's Waltham books out there that have serial numbers by date. And this one dates to the 1917-1918 period uh, for its manufacture. And probably was sold shortly after that, 1918. The case is a solid sterling case, or what's left of the case is solid sterling. And FaZe was a, a watch case company that's very well known. Uh, having gone out of business uh, in its original uh, incorporation period for, uh, around 1931 was, and was very much a victim of the Great Depression. Um, FaZe has been reconstituted as a uh, jeweler and uh, watch purveyor. They are still out of New York, but uh, FaZe's uh, trademarks are uh, apparently still in force, which is something I learned in getting ready for this talk. Uh, so this case and movement and, and as a watch has uh, very high collector appeal. There's uh, been a number of books uh, that have been written. Uh, Stan Kuznet, uh, who used to be in Chicago but now lives in Texas, has written a, uh, two very nice books about uh, trench watches, the uh, Waltham Trench Watches of the Great War and Elgin Trench Watches of the Great War. And there's uh, some very useful information in there, but there's other books um, excuse me, that also have information about military watches of, of World War I. So, but what's interesting is, is that uh, World War I uh, also has a, is the period that the, the waterproof or dustproof watches were uh, finally or uh, initially invented. Although the phase case, because of its snap on bezel, uh, and, and case back essentially emulating the pocket watch technology at the time for case design, it's not a particularly waterproof or especially dustproof case, which uh, would not deal well with the trench style warfare of, of the time. It wouldn't have lasted long. Although the one, one uh, uh, development from World War I that it definitely had was, uh, had a luminous dial where the numbers and the, indice, the, the indices of the dial and the uh, hands had been painted with radium. And if you're not familiar with radium, uh, radium has a 1700-year, uh, approximately 1700-year half-life. And after 100 years of uh, time period, the radium painting paint on the dial is almost as good as new. In fact, uh, it is 99.99% as radioactive as the day it was painted on. Um, but, but. Uh, here, the, the case back is what really is, I think, the most striking aspect of this case. And it's very nicely engraved. And the uh, engraving is John A. Grant, uh, Oil City, Pennsylvania. And it has a date, which is September the 14th of 1918 and uh, USA. So um, I, I, rather than scrapping out this case uh, and harvesting parts from the movement, I decided that uh, this would be a nice project to try to try to restore. And I had been looking for a, a, a watch that I wanted to do uh, casework and had been slowly acquiring equipment uh, for uh, uh, the eight millimeter lathe. And uh, there was also this article that had been in the back of my head for a considerable amount of time. Uh, this is by Phil Rickert, uh, who in uh, 2010 or 20 or 20, yeah, 2011, won uh, the Pritchard Prize for watch restoration. In this case, he restored 
uh, the movement and case of a Longines pocket watch. And I thought to myself a, a number of the techniques that he used might be applicable for, for men, essentially remaking a, a crystal bezel, which was the uh, principal feature missing from the case. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I thought some of the methods that he used to go about his fabrication for his uh, case restoration may not be applicable to a wristwatch. You can see in, in figure 12 um, that, and this is taken from his article, that what he is doing here is he's spinning a disc of silver on an eight millimeter lathe and a three jaw chuck. And what he started with is that was actually a uh, Mexican silver peso coin. Uh, and he machined from that solid disc uh, a crystal bezel. So not too horribly dissimilar from what I wanted to do. And uh, so I, I figured that in the, in the process of things, I actually should probably draw out what I want to do. So I did some measurements of the case. This is the case that I had on hand. So I figured out how big the, measure, the, the dimension should be. Um, I then translated this into what a crystal bezel should look like. I also had examples of bezels from other uh, World War I trench watches that I could look at and, and attempt to emulate. And so I worked on acquiring tooling. I have a very nice eight millimeter uh, Derbyshire made lathe that dates to about 1939. I've acquired uh, quite a number of attachments for it, uh, including a three jaw chuck, uh, uh, quite a good collection of wire bezel chucks or wire chucks. And, uh, but for the, for the actual forming of the, the bezel piece, I thought rather than starting with a uh, solid piece of um, sterling as, as uh, the, the gentleman that did the uh, pocket watch restoration, that what I should do is, is start with a uh, preformed piece and start with a curve. Uh, and so what I did is I bought uh, a, a set of dapping blocks uh, with uh, dapping punches. And the, this is a uh, th essentially a three by three inch damping block, and these are uh, highly polished uh, concave pits, and it comes with a uh, uh, damping punch that also has a uh, rounded top. And what I did was I uh, did, did some basic calculations to at least come up with an estimate of how big a diameter of sterling I should have. And so what I did is I scored out a disc from sterling, cutting this out by hand with a jeweler saw, and then I uh, punched it into the damping block. Uh, and one of the very nice things is if you mismeasure the size of your disc and after you round out the, the, uh, the shape, you end up with a very nice silver bell. And so I have two very nice silver bells that are now hanging in my uh, shop. And uh, whenever I screw something up, I just ring the bells to remind me of there's always something positive that comes out of it. But I then used uh, the lathe and a, uh, cross slide to mill out the center part of what was a bell to become the beginnings of a bezel. And uh, so I, I, one of the things I was able to take from uh, the previous work is that uh, the bezel sheet seat should probably come first. And so I uh, first cut the bezel seat and here is the, uh, this image here is where it's still sitting on the three jaw chuck, but I'm doing a test fit to see if I am getting the correct snap and uh, in a snug fit. And in fact, uh, the first try on doing this, I was able to uh, cut it properly and to size. I was very pleased with myself. Uh, so much so that I got a little bit ahead of myself and discovered that the three jaw chuck is not necessarily the best for trying to hold a bezel when you're going to cut the seat for the crystal. And as the uh, parlance of the day is, when you're doing something really good, you say you're crushing it. And well, I crushed it because as I was milling the bezel seat, it came loose from the chuck and was smashed between uh, the, uh, the three jaws and the uh, workings of the cross slide. And as you can see, it is uh, bent, dented. Uh, there are some pretty good nicks in it. But uh, what I did was I was actually able to uh, salvage this. I didn't have to start from scratch again. 
uh, what I did was I used the same forming block and the round punches to then reshape this back into a round piece. And you can see I am, I am now back in business and I decided and with the uh, three jaw chuck um, as uh, a recipe for possible future disaster, I thought that a, uh, using a, a piece of brass with a, uh, that fits into the snap of the crystals of the, of the bezel seat uh, would be sufficient to hold it. And it was just so happens that I had made a very similar uh, jig for working on a crystal bezel from a uh, case for a, um, a chronograph a couple of years ago that my, my friend Chris uh, Bubendorfer had helped me uh, create. Uh, and this brass disc is just simply held onto a cement chuck with uh, super glue. But it, it worked and got me through the effort to make uh, the crystal bezel or the bezel seat or the crystal seat, sorry. And so here we can see the progression from uh, the starting on, on trimming this down to where the diameter of the crystal seat is just a little bit larger than the indices of the, of the watch dial. So the next thing with, uh, now that the, the case has been, uh, has a crystal bezel again for it, I started in on the uh, restoration of the movement. Uh, for a complete movement, it was uh, in fairly acceptable stand, uh, condition for a 100-year-old watch, or a 102-year-old watch at this point, or a three-year-old watch now, actually. Um, there was uh, some issues from uh, use. For instance, uh, the pivot on the balance was broken. Excuse me. And these, uh, this, this movement is a single roller. Um, style uh, uh, escape or uh, balance wheel. And so uh, happily the staking set that I have is will accommodate removal of single rollers. And Waltham uh, is uh, unlike a lot of the Swiss watches at, at this time period, the, the staffs are not riveted in place. They are a friction fit staff. And so it was a simple matter of uh, being able to push the staff back uh, to remove the staff, pushing it out, and then to push in a new staff into the friction hub. And you can see in the center photograph just a, a little bit of the edge of the hub within the, the balance wheel. Now, uh, parts for these are getting somewhat scarce. And so uh, these pivots came in different sizes. And so what I focused on was trying to find a staff that was of the correct length and uh, the correct size for both the, the hub and also for the uh, roller table to fit onto. And so uh, I did have to modify the uh, size of the pivots. So a lot of the wristwatches, they had um, this, uh, I can't, I'm trying to remember if it went from, I started with a, a, a larger diameter uh, pivot, they were one tenth of a millimeter, and I had to bring it down to 0 0.08 of a millimeter. Uh, the other thing I found out is that uh, one of the crystal, one of the uh, jewels from uh, the balance had a pretty good fracture through it. And so in the spare part supply that I have, I was able to find a, uh, a new olive jewel to replace that. So going through uh, the standard process of uh, cleaning, oiling, and adjusting a, a wristwatch, uh, the simple time only movements from back then are, are pretty much straightforward once the parts are all cleaned and, and inspected for, for wear and this watch went back together pretty, pretty well. Uh, I think the only difference between a watchmaker of say 1920 and, and today is, is that using the synthetic lubricants, I, I have some level of expectation that the oiling should last slightly longer than a year. Um, in fact, I've got the, bent, the watch sitting on my, my desk here in front of me and it's running, although it's not on my wrist. I've got a World War II watch on my wrist today. Um, one of the things that I did do is I removed the radium loom from the one remaining hand and also from uh, the, the loom that was on the dial and, and used uh, modern Luminova, which is a photoreactive uh, luminescent material. 
and I added uh, some brown tint to the to the loom to try to get a, an aged look to it. And I, I think this is one of the better dials that I've done. But this is the dial as as it was received. So, and this is also the uh, the, the hour hand it was the hour hand that came with the watch. I was able to find uh, uh, some Waltham hands on eBay that uh, fit. So, and this the second hand is just a bit short, but but is a Waltham hand. So John Grant turns out that uh, he was a, I was able to find out about his military service by using uh, uh, Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com, which are uh, essentially two services by the same company. And uh, he had filed for veterans benefits at one point in the 1930s. Uh, and this uh, card here uh, lists uh, his military service. And he, he didn't go to Europe, uh, but he did have uh, relatively late service in, in and after the war. Um, so he uh, would have gone into the army as a private and he very rapidly advanced to become a Sergeant First Class by the time that he was mustered out of the service in less than a year, year's time. Um, so what was interesting is, is that the date on here and his registration card that uh, I've, I am inferring that what happened is, is that he had, when he registered for the draft, he put down an exemption that he was taking care of his mother. And uh, I, doing some additional research, I discovered that his father had, uh, had died in an, an accident. He apparently had fallen off of a roof while doing work uh, leaving his uh, wife essentially destitute. And, and John uh, had, was just coming of age and uh, was working as an, as an accountant in a bank and was doing a, a seemingly a fairy, uh, fairly good job of uh, keeping his mother afloat along with his younger sibling. Uh, and so he had, uh, had requested this, but his mother passed away at, uh, from what the coroner's report said was um, pneumonia. And uh, I think the inference there is, is that it was early in 19, early enough in the 1918 pandemic that it more than likely was uh, she passed away of influenza, um, which then freed him up to become subject to service, call out. And you'll notice that this has been X'd out. And I think that he was, he uh, bought the watch shortly after he was conscripted because this date is smack dab between uh, when he left for uh, Camp Lee. And, and or between the date of his mother's death and, and Camp Lee. So uh, like the other uh, person who restored a, a watch doing work on both movement and bezel, uh, I have uh, declared my intent to enter the watch for the Pritchard Prize for this coming year. Uh, the, the, according to the rules, the watch work had to have been wholly completed between April 1st of uh, 2019 and April, or I'm sorry, April 1st of 2020 and April, um, and March 31st of 2021. And so I did all, the, even though I bought the watch in 2019, all the work was completed in late May or late April and May of last year. And so uh, in communication with Jim Price, I have uh, filed my intent. And here you can see uh, what the before pictures were. And here is the after picture on a uh, new fabric band that is uh, as close to approximation for what originally came with the watch. Um, this, this is a, uh, Getting to be a habit, I think. Uh, the, the military style World War I era watches. Uh, I've, I've been amassing quite a collection. I, I jokingly say that I am not a Waltham collector, collector uh, although I now have quite, quite a uh, range of Waltham uh, World War I era watches. And, and there, are four, there were four sizes of watches during World War I. Uh, there was the 3 0 size, there was the zero size. They also cased uh, six size movements 
for wristwatch. And according to Stan Kubernetes uh, books, the, uh, both Elgin and Waltham also cased uh, 12 size movements specifically for uh, wristwatches. And I also am a sucker for engravings on wristwatches. Uh, this is one that I bought just uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, this is the condition of the dial that, as it arrived. It was uh, in pretty sad shape, missing lugs. And I uh, have uh, a few weeks ago completely restored this watch, including uh, salvaging the crown, fabricating lugs, and overhauling the movement. And this is uh, inscribed VLS to CH Brandt. And it's Adair, Iowa, USA. And uh, Chris Hans Brandt actually did go to Europe and serve six months in France. Um, but that's also the end of my talk. Uh, so thank you very much. All right. Hey, that was great. Um, fantastic job on that. And good luck with the, with the prize. Um, anyone have any questions for uh, Jack on this presentation tonight? I could, uh... I'm looking for the applaud hand and I can't, <laughs> I don't know where it's at, but that was really great. Thank you, Jack. Nice job, Jack. One comment that I had on making the bezel that Bill Tapp told me that he likes to use a square wire and bend it into a ring and solder it and then try and hammer it around a mandrel till it's round and then puts that in a bezel chuck and machines the final shape. Uh, yeah, there's um, uh, Stephen Pao, pa oh, I can't think of his last name. There is a German watchmaker who, uh, has written a book about uh, pocket watch uh, fabrication or pocket watch case fabrication. And he is using that exact method where he uses a heavy gauge uh, square wire, bends it around into uh, a round shape and then machines it. And I've, I have thought about doing that. And uh, honestly, I, I wanted to try uh, this route to see if, if it was even feasible at a, and it, and it worked really well. I thought it was uh, sufficiently different enough to be on, to be uh, novel to go halfway between uh, what uh, the, the previous winner of the Pritchard Prize had tried with a, a disc and uh, trying to mill out uh, a prefab or pre-curved uh, surface. And uh, no, no pesos were harmed in the restoration of this watch. No pesos were harmed in the restoration of this watch. <laughs> yeah, those are and those are antiques. They they stopped making pesos out of sterling in the nineteen early sixties, I think. But several bells were created, which is good. Two were. <laughs> I'm sure you've told us this before, Jack, this is Terry. How do you do the hands to make them look like the luminescence, but they are not covered with the dangerous uh, chemical? Well, so what I do is I take the hands and, and, and the dial and I will submerge them into a small dish of water. And using a toothpick, I will um, remove the loom off the dial and hands. And then uh, there actually isn't a whole lot of luminescent material on them. And uh, I probably shouldn't admit this, but it just goes down the drain. Um, and then the, the hands and uh, dial will then get, uh, go through the ultrasonic to get any remaining bits off. And uh, then uh, use the modern uh, luminescent kits to, to redo the material that goes on onto the, the numbers in the hands.
So would you be willing to do a video sometime on showing how you fill the hands and redo the numbers? I, I would be willing to do that. Uh, the trick is to find a camera that would sit propped on the bench. It is uh, very up close work when I do it. Yes, that is the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I've, I'm, I've done some touch-up work on uh, clock dials, and honestly, the only way I can do it is under a microscope. Otherwise, I don't get good results. So I don't know what you're using for mag magnification, but I uh, the way I do it is I apply it using a, an oiler, and I do it uh, just using my uh, watch loop that's attached to my glasses, and I can. Uh, usually get one dial and a pair of hands done before the uh, luminescent material has gotten too thick uh, and has to be tossed. I had one more question, uh, Jack. On the dial that I had on this watch, if my video is on, uh, this, Waltham uh, Secomatic. I noticed when it came back, they had made no attempt to clean the dial, and there's little tiny um, microscopic flecks of just from old age. How would you, as with your jeweler's knowledge, clean the dial? Would you get uh, a cotton swab or something and some alcohol, or what's the best way on a pocket are you watch? Planning to remove the dial from the movement? I'm not sure that that's necessary. Uh, Is it? Well, it, it would dictate how you go about cleaning it. Uh, you could use, if you just take the, the, bezel, the uh, crystal bezel off, you could use a bit of uh, the gray rotico to, uh, I would just go after the individual specs um, using that. It is, uh, when it's new, it generally doesn't leave residue behind and it's not the, the tacky or green, so the, the gray color, Rodico. Well, I'll have to talk to you further about that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really thorough presentation. I'm, I'm almost struggling to, to find a question. I think <laughs> <laughs> you covered, you covered. You, quiet down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that, I like that you, provided some context and then the the watch restoration was sort of you know the the meat of it all but then i think the actual research into um john was important to to sort of bookend you know the 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 overall sort of global context global conflict the context of this with sort of the the person that the watch actually belonged to and stuff and i it was it was cool that you were able to find all that stuff. I know, I, I know all of that is available now, and it's it's one of those things that I probably should should do more of, especially with all these great inscriptions that we find in these great. Yeah. We find well, it's it. it I, I spent an enormous amount of time on Ancestry.com and newspapers. I even bought a subscription to uh, Stars and Stripes because they recently had. Uh, Art, had uh, digitized some of the archives that cover World War One, and I was able to find a considerable amount of, of information about them. And the, the the main question that I haven't been able to answer yet is is that I I have found him uh, in all the census that are out through 1940. Uh, he and his wife uh, they got married shortly before the 1930 census. I found them, and then in the 1940 census, which I find is absolutely fascinating, is they there's no children listed in the household mm. and so i i am of the opinion that uh and, and then for both he and his wife there's there's no obituary there's only a only the death notices from social security and mm. the coroner's reports out of texas so he he they he actually after the war moved around the country quite a bit and uh being from oil uh city pennsylvania he actually ended up working in the oil industry as, as an accountant um, I can't, I find no record of him going to college, um, but you didn't need to go to college to become an accountant. All you had to do was pass the CPA. Mm. And that seems to be what he did. 
Uh, he worked both for uh, the oil company, uh, oil, oil industries, including Standard Oil. He worked for the railroad for a while. Uh, he lived in Pennsylvania. He lived in Ohio. He lived in Michigan, which is where he got married. For a while, he was in Wyoming, uh, right in the 19... Uh, in the 1920s, he was in Wyoming, which is right when it makes sense because that's when the oil, oil fields in Wyoming were being developed for the first time. Uh, and, uh, and then he ends up in Texas. Uh, well, where else do you, where you, every place that you could find oil, he was there at some point. Uh, but I, th I think he, he uh, and his wife both passed away without having direct heirs. Mm. Um, I did find a grand nephew uh, because I would, I'd be very interested in finding a photograph of him. Mm. Uh, there is no, I have not been able to get a photograph of him. And, and the nephew, the grand nephew actually wrote me back and he said that uh, he had never met his uncle or his great uncle, but and, uh, he didn't have any photographs. And that he didn't know who would. Um, it was mm. kind of a short note back and I kind of get the imp impression that maybe there was some some sort of family type thing that had happened. Mm. He, he may not have known his, his uh, um, family, mm. but because I, 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 because for me, I, but then again, I'm also, you know, more of a genealogy buff. I've got all sorts of information about my ancestors and researching my wife's family. And, um, and so this, this is just, you know, feeding into that beast of uh, trying to train to dig up history, but it, it is, he had a rather interesting life from what I can from gather mm -hmm. and, and got around. So this is just a little, little snippet into who he was. <clears throat> yeah. It's cool how these are, these are remnants of that. I don't, yeah. I don't know that I currently have a watch that's engraved with my enough information on it that somebody would be able to do something like that for me a hundred years from now, just maybe, a, a bit of a wake-up call, actually. So, <laughs> I, th I think if anything, you want to scrub it out. <laughs> uh, probably um, leave it behind on Facebook. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's you got social media now. Yeah. Well, I, I I have what I refer to as my imitation grandpa watch. I have uh, I I purposely bought a wristwatch off of eBay because it had the initials R G W. And those, those are my grandfather Wood's initials. It was his, his name is Ray George Wood. And uh, so that, that'll just confuse my ancestors. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, I also have a watch that is uh, happy birthday, uh, dad to Jack, and it's dated 1920. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also have a vintage wristwatch that has my initials on it as well, too. Mm. Uh, that was a very lucky find. And, uh, I should probably wear that one this coming week. <laughs> wow and then uh, the uh but but the, but the flip side too is is that um and i and i know sean you know this that i, I bought a watch uh and it came i that it's very much in the interest of of both grin for me and uh but it had a really nice inscription on it and not only did i track down uh find out who the original owner of the watch was um but i made contact with one of his sons and his son was just absolutely ecstatic to learn about the watch. Um, and so I, I ended up returning the watch to the family. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, it was a mystery because uh, uh, his father had other wristwatches that were engraved in the exact same manner that whenever he went to Europe, he bought a watch and he would have his name, the country he bought the watch and the year engraved on the watch. And so here I have this watch that has uh, L.E.M. Goldstein, France, 1944, engraved on the back of it. Uh, the, the thing was is that his, his children had no clue about the watch. They came from a seller in the U.K. And the seller in the U.K., when I asked him, well, where did you get this watch? It's an American sold watch. The communication stopped. He stopped answering my, my notes. And so I... I, I suggested to uh, the son, I said, you know, I'm, I'm curious how this ended up in the UK. And, and he, he wrote me, said back to me that he was curious too, but then he also found in his father's photo album, three photographs that were obviously taken in London. And he said to me, he goes, well, this was actually, this 
World War II is before he met his mother. And so maybe he was dating uh, a young lady in, in London and gave her the watch. And I, and I said, well, that's, that's excellent. My, my going hypothesis was is that, uh, that he'd lost at the poker game. <laughs> and this was his collateral and he couldn't pay. <laughs> and there's this pause in the conversation. He goes, yeah, that's also very possible too. <laughs> so, so who knows how it ended up in the UK, but it got back to the family. Wow. I had an idea <clears throat> for that missing photo. You can all probably contact a high school in that city. It'd be a graduation picture. You can also contact a library in that city or area to see what they had. Maybe there's a graduation photo of some kind. And also uh, the state, they, uh, as a long shot, they usually have a historical section as they do in Colorado. And they may have some kind of photo of him uh, or newspaper clipping from around that time. Yeah, I, I, uh, Ancestry.com is actually scan, has a scan of the yearbook for the high school there. Okay. And uh, I, his photograph is not in there. And in fact, I'm not convinced he actually graduated from high school. Okay. Um, he, uh, with, with the death of his father and needing to go to work, um, he, he more than likely dropped down of, out of high school. And uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's the case. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't able to find his photograph uh, from a high school, but I found his wife's picture from high school. Um, the, uh, and uh, there are, the, there's uh, newspapers.com is somewhat limited that they don't have every newspaper yet scanned, uh, which would be a huge undertaking because every small podunk town across America at one point had their own paper. Um, but yeah, it, it, writing to the, the town or the historical society or the library uh, actually is something I had not thought of. Thank you. I, I guess I had a question. What is, what would it look like in some of the finished photos, the, the, the middle section of the case and the case back had sort of, you didn't have to do any solder work on there. So it, it you were able to maintain the original patina that was on there. But yes. the being new, do you, did, well, did you keep it as sort of just like the raw bright silver or did you patina it to match? And what, I guess, what was your choice in whatever that decision was? I, I left it as the bright silver because uh, I, I, I thought trying to make it into the patina to match is, um, it, it just struck me as wrong. I wasn't, I was trying to restore the watch, not, not, make it like uh, not trying to fool anyone. And in fact, you know, the one thing that I did mention is, is that um, in, in the manufacturing process, the original manufacturing process by phase, uh, there is a, there's the serial number on the back, which is stamped. But then the last four digits of the ser last four or three digits of the serial number are often hand engraved into the, the, the movement bezel using Roman numerals. And then those Roman numerals also appear on crystal bezels, and if, especially on the phase cases. And so what I did was I etched the Roman numerals to match the case bezel or the case, case serial number. Mm -hmm. But I also then etched into the crystal bezel made in May 2020. So that there'd be no doubts that this was uh, not the original bezel because the thing is, is I had I had a I had an original bezel from another phase case that I was able to look at and to and to gauge how how it was machined and, and trying to emulate it. And the starting point was: do you start with a solid piece? Do you start with a curved piece? Do you start with uh, square wire that's been bent around and, and soldered? And uh, the one thing I could tell is is that I don't think that when they made the case originally that they started with a uh, piece of wire that had been formed around and soldered together. I think they started with a solid 
solid piece you know, that had been uh, stamped and then machined to finish. Mm -hmm. So um, that that's part of why I went the route that I went. So it's so it's still the bright the bright brass at least for as long as before it patinas to whatever well, it's, it's, be it's bright off. it's the bright sterling so um, yeah but, not, uh, but yeah it's it's bright sterling and philip patinas and the thing is it's now uh coming on on uh you know <laughs> it's, it's still as bright as the day i made it practically <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe there's something of the the alloys that uh rio grande is using for uh their sterling uh that is inhibiting the tarnish <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, one one dip in a hot tub with it, and it'll it'll uh, it'll start. To <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no. <laughs> right, that's enough questions out of you. <laughs> cool. All right. I'm going to go right. mute. Any other questions for uh, for Jack before we uh, close up shop? No, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you very well, much. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I think, Tim, is your hand up? I guess I guess not. I see Tim. I, I, I was waving goodbye, and thank you, Jack. Nice job. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And, and I owe you because you actually still for the bezel check that you sent me. <laughs> no problem. No worries. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Uh, very good job, Jack. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you all next time. Take care now. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Have a great yeah. day. Thank you. Thanks. Great presentation.